How are you guys doing? Good? I just want to tell you that I love you guys and I love being here. And this morning, I want to talk about belonging. I want to talk about belonging. I went to college at Philadelphia College of Bible. Then it was Philadelphia Biblical University. And now it's Cairn University. What will it be next week? <clears throat> I was a relatively new believer when I went to college and knew very little about the Bible. Uh, I was from the Bronx. And then I moved to Edison when I was a, a young teen in a suburban area. Uh, I was into playing baseball and hanging out with friends. Although I was in the Boy Scouts, I was never into the wilderness being from the Bronx. Uh, during my second year at school at Philadelphia College of Bible, I had a great set of roomies. And of course, uh, we had no money for clothes, <clears throat> just like any other college kid. And here are most of my roommates pictured recently. Fine, young group of guys. Uh, since it was a Bible uh, school, we visited the Pope together. We made album covers for no reason. <clears throat> and occasionally we created tape face monsters. See, this is what you do in Bible college. My two closest friends were from Long Island. Chris had re recently moved to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, they grew up in Christian families and became followers of Jesus as young children. It wasn't until I was 21 before I made that same decision. Uh, they were in a church that had a thing called Brigade, kind of a Boy Scouts for Baptists. They were hugely into camping, rock climbing, and wilderness hiking. Uh, for our first fr spring break back in 1983, we decided the day before to break, to, to go on spring break to Florida, the day before we left. We had no idea what we were going to do, and we said, let's go to Florida. Okay. Just like good Baptist boys do. So we hopped into my 1976 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme and took off with about $35 between us, passes to Disney World, and a gas card. <clears throat> we slept in rest areas along the way. We got caught. A friend was down there with Campus Crusade, and she let us sleep on the floor of her hotel room. We got caught. <clears throat> we wound up survi surviving on a diet of grape knee-high and moon pies, just like all good young Baptist boys do. <clears throat> but we had a great time, and it was the furthest south that we'd ever been. There we go. All right. <clears throat> How many people have ever been by there? All right. How many people here have met Pedro? <laughs> uh, fall break in our senior year, Rob and Chris decided we would hike some of the Appalachian Trail. This was 1984, and a presidential election was taking place, much like today. We packed our backpacks and each took a part of the tent that we were going to sleep in. We hiked about 15 miles up the mountain, before we broke out the sleeping gear. Unbeknownst to my roomies, see, I knew nothing about camping and stuff, uh, much to their chagrin, uh, part of my idea of hiking included bringing something so I could listen to the Reagan-Mondale debate that night. I was wondering why I was struggling high in, uh, hiking up the mountain. Now, for those who are under 30, you're probably wondering, why is this unusual? We go everywhere with our lifeline. Our iPad is always there. Our iPod is always with us. Our iPhone is always with us. We're always wired. This was my iPod. There we go. <clears throat> Here's my iPod. And I was stuck to eating seeds and drinking water. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> you, you see, I thought about the boom box. I forgot about eating, which is kind of hard for you to imagine. 
Rob and Chris brought some food. I was okay with that until they said we had to hang our food up so that the bears wouldn't get the... The bears didn't want... There's the bear. The, the bears didn't want it either. Did I sleep that night? Not really. Then I had to, the nerve to uh, play music in the wilderness as we hiked down the mountain a couple of days later. Here I am, sing your praise to the Lord. Come on, everybody. That was probably what was out then. These two guys are going, I want to kill him. I want to kill him. In both cases, we or I remembered the optional stuff but forgot the key stuff, like food. How could you forget about food? How could I forget about food? I brought the optimal stuff, optional stuff. It's like we go through life and we try to decide what can't we live without and what's optional. If you, ha if you leave out one of the key components of life, if you leave out food, you can spoil the whole thing. So we process things, sports practice, Facebook, Xbox, church. Where does that all fit? Is it optional or is it necessary? Everyone else does it, so we do it too. We process that. This has never been as true as when it comes to biblical community. Living life together with others who are followers of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about Sunday mornings like this because many of you know somebody else here today. However, this isn't the ideal place to get to know and to be known. As social beings, to meet with others during the week, how critical is that? How critical is it? Well, it feels pr pretty optional, and we have many reasons why it feels optional. One reason we hear is that if I go to a gro growth group or to a Bible study, I'll feel dumb. I'll feel dumb. We go there, and the leader says, open your book to Hezekiah chapter 3, verse 16, footnote B, in your co concordance, and you're thinking, yeah. I know this is a book called the Bible, and it has words, and I can read. Other than that, I'm clueless. Some people will get that. <clears throat> so we worry that if we go there, we're going to look stupid. And that's a valid fear. Another fear we have, especially guys, that is, is that we're going to have to talk. And we're going to have to talk about our feelings. And we'll get there, and someone will start sharing. You know, I really had a bad week this week. My doggy was sick and I had to rub some medicine on him, and I had to get a lot off my chest. Let's share. Let's hug. Group hug. Ew. Stay away from me. Who knows where those hands were? If you were in a growth group that I was in, I'd have to have a hygiene talk with you. Guys don't want to talk about our feelings like that. Some of us have huge reasons for going. Maybe our spouse or our kids aren't even on the same page as us. Maybe they're not working on their relationship with Jesus, and it's a bit of a disconnect within the marriage or family. We have to do it on our own. Time is another factor. We feel as if we don't have enough. There's a little league. There's working and working late. For me, it's MLB TV. Or a date with our Xbox 360, Call of Duty, Black Ops. No. If I miss that, I'm going to be really cranky. We struggle with our time management. And then there's the church. Many of us have been to church in the past and then maybe stopped going. Or this might be the first time that you're ever in church, and we welcome you. We're, we worry about people not being real. You go to a group, and the lady's there, and she says, oh, bless your heart. Oh, yes. 
I'm just so blessed. Jesus just pours out his blessings on me. My children are his perfection, and my house is almost heaven. Bless your heart. And you're going, what in the world is that? My life is not like that. My kids are messed up and they have me. My job situation is awful and I'm about to lose my house. I, I worry if I'm myself and there's all these perfect people here, I'll feel really weird. So we work hard at Stagecoach to make this place a, a place where you can be real. That's important to us because we're some pretty messed up people. The last thing is that we're worried people will try to fix us. You ever be worried about somebody, I don't want to be fixed. You go to a, a growth group and you, you, act, you actually like the people there. They're just as screwy as I am. So you start to open up a little bit and say, guys, I struggle with my weight. <clears throat> you get one of two reactions off that. The first is the person that says, you are not, you're skinny. Come on now, you don't have a problem. And then there's the guy that says, this is what I did. <laughs> I did the biggest loser and lost five pounds in five months. Then I switched to South Beach diet, and that didn't work too well. So I became a vegan, but I found out that I couldn't have meat. Now I do Nutrimist. I can inhale my food and not worry. I can snack between meals, and down another three and I'm down another three pounds this past year. I could be your trainer. <laughs> you know, we could do this. Um, I just wanted to share a struggle with my life. I wasn't looking to be fixed. So we worry about that. And these are reasons we have that make community optional. With something as important as the community of believers, friends, we need to see what God's Word has to say. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Genesis 1, 26. It's all the way at the beginning of your Bible way at the beginning, probably the second or third page. This is the story of God creating the universe. We're at a part where he's already created the heavens and the earth and light and darkness. He separated the land from the, sea, from the seas. He created the animals. Now he's going to cap it all up with the most beautiful piece of all. So verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Friends, this is a great verse. We get to rule over livestock. We get to eat hamburgers. Steak. It's right there in that verse. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He repeats himself three times, just in case you don't get it the first time. Human beings are the capstone of creation. Look at that first verse where he says, let us make man in our image. He uses the plural form of the first, whoop, of the first person here, our. It's we language. This isn't God acting like a queen of England, you know. We are not amused, so we, will not make, so we will make man in our image. It's not the queen of England. God says, he says this because from eternity past, at the beginning of time, he has existed as the Trinity. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Friends, this is a great mystery. The God who created everything in the universe and crowned his creation with men and with women existed from eternity past in perfect community. And we're made to be in the likeness of God. So one thing this means is that we're created for community. Just as God exists in perfect relationship of mutual submission, 
So we are designed to live in a loving relationship that is characterized by mutual loving submission. This is how God made us. Community, friends, is the key. Community is the key. It's not optional. Let's look at, the, at three reasons on why community is key. First reason, we're incomplete without community. We're incomplete without community. Genesis 1 gives us a quick view of creation. Genesis 2 zooms in on the creation of man and woman, the story of Adam and Eve. Chapter 2, verse 18 in Genesis, it says, Then the Lord said, It's not good for the man to be alone. Why? Ladies, what happens when you go away for a few days? Right. Adam standing in the garden, rummaging through a pile of used fig leaves. And they were not ashamed yet. They were using fig leaves for other things. And it got real messy. And God's looking and says, it's not good for man to be alone. (laughs) So God created a helpmate or a helper for Adam. Up until this time, everything God created, he said, was good. Light, good. Birds, pretty good. Oceans, real good. See, it was all good. Then he creates man alone and he says, this ain't good. So he created a helpmate. He's incomplete. Incomplete without community. This story replays in each and every one of our lives. Our lives are impacted by our friends. In high school, many of my relationships were based on surface things, drugs and alcohol. We hung out waiting for someone to show up with weed or a case of bud, and we'd sit and, of course, consume, rarely talking about anything important because the important thing then was to get buzzed. Even though I had a circle of people surrounding me, I was really alone. I was incomplete. The story of how God turned my life around is a story of community. I started dating a Christian girl and I wanted to become a little bit more romantically intimate with her. So I started to read the Bible and it affected me to the point of my becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. At the time I was in the Air Force and I really didn't know any other people who were committed to following Jesus. So God started to really redirect my life through a small group with Christ followers from my church where I got saved, who were right around my age. There they are, fine-looking group. We got together regularly for Bible study and having fun, and they accepted my quirky ways. They weren't shocked about some of the ideas that I had. They answered every question that I had to the best of their ability. God used community to grow my relationship with him, and bring me some measure of completeness. You see, we're, we're incomplete without community. We need to build it in amongst God's people intentionally, or we'll find, we'll find it someplace else. It'll be the old high school buddies, or the guys at the bar, or at the country club, or book club, or whatever. We seek it out and find it. Those people will influence the quality and direction of our life. It's part of the reason why God asks us to seek out his community amongst the family. So the second reason why community with people is key is it's not optional. It's not optional. It brings connection with God. It brings connection with God. Matthew 18, verse 20 says this, For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there amongst them. Sounds pretty awesome. But what does that mean? Is he secretly sitting in the seat next to us? 
We don't really know what to do with that, but it means the God of the universe, the one who spoke us into existence, when people are gathered together in the name of Jesus, his spirit is present with them in a powerful way. And when we connect to each other, that's part of what brings connection to God, when we connect with each other. Some of you are here today, not hearing a word that I'm saying. I, I used to be a teacher. I guess I still am, once a teacher, always a teacher. But I'm sure some of you are thinking Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. You come here with a heavy load on your heart, maybe a lawsuit pending or a serious illness in your family. You're trying to reconcile your marriage. There's a custody thing with the kids. Your kids are out of control, and that has fo followed you he in here this morning. So everything you hear this morning is filtered through that. Another reason why community is key is that the Great Commission requires community. The Great Commission requires community. <clears throat> now, if you're not familiar with that phrase, the Great Commission, you'll want to become familiar with it because it's used in the Christian community. Could be Christianese, but it's, it's a biblical term. The Great Commission is what we call a passage in the Bible, Matthew 28. At the very end of Jesus' life, he says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands, all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Friends, this is Jesus commissioning people, sending them out. You see, Jesus himself was sent. He came back to our earth to teach this wonderful message to people and then tells his followers there to continue to teach that message by going out. He says, it's not done with me. Your existence is about continuing my work. So we're doing the work of Jesus. The message Jesus was sharing was put like this. The things that we see, that we can smell and touch and hear and taste, it's not all there is. All the countries and kingdoms and leaders and politicians we see in the world are not what all that it is. There's another kingdom that's eternal, that's spiritual, but it's not separated. It's seeping into our world. And one day when Jesus returns, this kingdom will come with power. You won't be able to say no to it. When Jesus is revealed as creator of our world, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and every knee will bow whether we want to or not. But right now we live in an era between Jesus' death and his return. Part of what that means is that God's kingdom is seeping into our world characterized by people sharing relationships of love, forgiveness, and hope. Another way of saying this is... You, you know this life we're living where everything is decaying and we eat, drink, and tomorrow we die. Everything's kind of passing away. Well, another life is possible. Beyond everything that we see, beyond everything that we feel, beyond everything that we touch, there is an eternal age, an age where things don't break down, where rust and moths do not destroy, and life from the age is seeping into our lives. It's called eternal life. A life where we live off of every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The wine we drink, it's called eternal life. That life changes us here and changes us now. The Oak Ridge Boys, anybody ever hear of the Oak Ridge Boys? Elvira. Yeah. Well, before they, before they decided to give up singing gospel music, they had a song called, You're So Heavenly Minded, You're No Earthly Good. 
But where the kingdom is present, followers gather in his name to minister here on earth. So when you join a growth group, when you join one of the small group Bible studies here, when you're in a community of believers, you're an outpost of the kingdom of heaven. When you have a community that meets and it's centered on God's word and people share their lives and relationships are characterized by forgiveness, by love, you are demonstrating eternal life right here and right now. John 17, Jesus is praying to God in front of his, his disciples. And he says, I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus says our unity is a, is a picture to this world that Jesus was sent from God, that he returned to God, and that he's coming again. Our lives are pictures of the kingdom that is to come, and the life in that age to come is available to us right now in Jesus Christ. We live it out in community with other followers of Jesus. What do you do with that? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're not in a community with other believers, please do that. Why? Because that's the church. That's the church. The church isn't a building or a place or an institution. The church is the body of Christ, the people of God. We're organized here in this local gathering of believers, and God's church is his plan to save the world. There is no plan B. We're it. That's the only reason why we're left here, is to give others the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're organized here in this local gathering of believers, and God, God wants us to, to be plan A, to be, his, to be his disciples, to be his workers. We can only do that when we gather with other believers. So I urge you to get into community with other believers. Here at Stagecoach, we have growth groups as one way to try and live out this community. You can express your interest by filling out a connection card. I think I even have one here. <clears throat> These connection cards, if you would just take one of those, if you're interested in being a part of a, a growth group, just write growth, put your name, email, and write growth group somewhere on the card. And then invite people to experience what the kingdom of God is like. Friends, neighbors, co-workers, maybe a, the person sitting next to you. There are people here who would love to go, but they don't know anybody yet, and nobody's asked them. So they're waiting to be asked. We're not playing growth groups anymore. We're getting serious. We're having a training session to help you understand what groups are all about, and that'll be coming up pretty soon. There's one other group here that's people who are not followers of Christ. You're trying to kind of weigh out the claims of Jesus Christ and have not committed yourself to him by crossing that line of faith. If Jesus really is the Son of God, who has come to take away the sins of the world, what's my place in it? Well, I invite you to join a growth group and see if we're real or not. In other words, come and judge for yourself. <clears throat> it's one thing for me to stand up here, or actually for me to sit up here, and, and talk about this and encourage you to take the next step in your relationship with God. But when you guys are committed to living that out 
and inviting your friends and neighbors and people in this church to, to help them take the next step in their relationship with God. If you help them make the ne that next step, that's when you'll see God work powerfully in our small community here, in our state, in our country, and in our world. People will know that another life is possible. Let's pray. As men come forward for the benevolence offering, again, I implore you to get into a growth group. Heavenly Father, you bow your head and pray. Heavenly Father, help me, Lord, to live in community with others. As we live in community, may we connect with God, and may we live out the Great Commission. Help us to remember to invite people to experience community. Help us to realize the importance of community, Lord, that it's not optional, that it's a part of our everyday life. We pray for those here who are hurting physically, mentally, emotionally. Please grant them an addition, a, additional amount of grace. And as we take the benevolence offering, may we give in abundance, perhaps twice the amount that we normally give, Lord. And may we use these gifts wisely for your kingdom work. I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.